Thanks for signing in. Um, wh who we have here in the room today and we'll be speaking with, and first to us and then we'll open up for conversation, is uh, myself, Catherine Bargan. I'm the Restorative Justice Coordinator and Program Manager here at the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Also have Aaron Lyons with Community Justice Initiatives and Alex Zuer from North Shore Restorative Justice Society. And we are scheduled today to be online together from 1 p.m., which is now, until 2.30 p.m. at a maximum. What we're going to do is first open up with a little context. That will be myself providing a little bit of background on standards in restorative justice and the issues around that. Then we'll be asking Erin Lyons to tell us a bit about the project that came about um, related to, well, the project uh, related to developing um, standards in restorative justice, uh, victim-sensitive standards and exploring those. And Erin was involved in the beginning of, of this project, will be able to tell us a lot about that. And then Alex will uh, be able to talk about participating in the pilot of implementing those standards and how that went. So that's the flow for today. I'll start off by, as I said, setting the context. So for those of you online um, or listening today, you're, I, I, I a little bit cheekily have talked to people before about saying that this is a spicy topic with standards in restorative justice, uh, victim-sensitive standards at that. And that's because within the field of restorative justice, um, some of you will be well aware of this, but uh, for those who aren't aware, the concept of standards in restorative justice has been quite controversial. It's been more typical for people to think of restorative justice being um, using guidelines and principles and outlining values. But the concept of standards uh, often raises a lot of worry around being too prescriptive, not being flexible, or being dictated by some power, probably government, towards co gra community or the grassroots. And those have been very, very legitimate concerns and, um, and worries around standards and restorative justice. That said, what uh, I've certainly noticed over the last decade and a half or more is, and but in particular over the last several years, is that referral sources, police, Crown Council, others, clients, victim service groups, uh, other stakeholders, have really started to be vocal as, as an interest in restorative justice has grown and grown, saying, but how do we know what to expect from a restorative justice group? Are they operating in a manner that we can trust? How do we know, how do we recognize a good quality program from, from another one? And how do we feel safe referring our clients there or clients themselves asking, how do we know we'll be treated in a way that, um, that, that's outlined for us? So, because most restorative justice groups have been comfortable in the world of principles and values, this idea of standards or uh, being measured against quality it was def is definitely a new idea. There's not a lot of research out there. There's not a lot of examples out there of actual standards being used uh, within restorative justice programs. Uh, standards, however, are the, are the things that help actually assess quality of service. They should be measurable. And additionally, they can help with restorative justice groups in their succession planning, too, so that any new folks coming on board are aware with, of what the standards, standards of practice are for, for an agency. So we keep bumping up against this issue of standards. Uh, should we go for it? Should we not? Should we ask for them? Should we not? And wrapped up in that, of course, is the role of government. And the dilemma that's created if government is having a role in prescribing standards for communities. And as we'll be talked about a little more, um, you'll see that this project we're talking about today was entirely community-driven with government in a supportive role. 
and that was very intentional. Um, right from the beginning, there we uh, here within government, we asked to be a part of the steering committee so that we could hear what was going on and figure out how to support the project, but we were not directly involved in piloting the standards or in um, providing specific input on what we wanted to see for standards. So this was a project that was designed to be empowering for communities, community-driven with the support of government where uh, appropriate. There's also one more piece I wanted to speak to, and that is how um, many people are talk are um, may conflate sometimes the concept of standards and standardization. And I'm just going to take a moment here before I talk about that to bring up our PowerPoint so that uh, folks can see our names and so on. This, um, so please just bear with me for a moment. One moment, please. Okay, now folks should probably be seeing the PowerPoint slide, uh, Developing Victim Census Standard and Restorative Justice, So, uh, with all our names there. So as I was saying, one of the um, specific aspects of standards and standardization is something we just want to make sure is clear up front, standards being um, measurable uh, and guiding practices um, and suggestions really for, for good practice, Standardization being about making everything the same and making sure work happens in a similar manner. So I have a, a lighthearted metaphor I like to share um, around uh, standards versus standardization around restaurants or even food trucks. Like, for example, I went out today for uh, my lunch downtown to add a food to, to a food truck. And we might say, okay, well, we would definitely expect food trucks, all food trucks, to have standards of some kind. So those are probably implemented by... Uh, an external body, the Ministry of Health probably, saying we expect that every food truck will have certain standards. However, we don't expect food trucks to be standardized. Uh, I could have chosen today from Thai, Mexican, uh, shawarma, falafel, um, hot dogs, you name it. So we're not looking for anything that's standardized, but we would expect that there would be standards. We're not just expecting that people in a food truck would say, well, I have a real passion for food, so it doesn't matter to how many times I wash my hands or anything like that. We, we just have this passion, and, and that's what we care about. We would expect that there would be some standards along with that passion so that we know that we are getting something that is quality. But we aren't expecting anything to be standardized in the sense of we don't want everything to be exactly the same. So standards still provides flexibility. And I, uh, to learn more about that, I'll, I'll now be inviting Aaron Lyons to speak about how this innovative pilot was born around stand, uh, developing victim-sensitive standards and restorative justice, and talk about how they created uh, these voluntary, flexible, victim-sensitive standards. All right. Well, hi, everyone. It's Aaron. Um, I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to, to share this with you, and I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to having some discussion at the end of this. So thank you for uh, signing in or calling in and for your interest. Um, so I was a part of a, of a committee, a steering group, uh, that came together uh, to try something out with, uh, with regard to standards. And, and really the spirit of this was that we were hearing from a lot of uh, referral sources uh, and, and most importantly uh, for the current project from victim services about a perception in restorative justice uh, that it was feeling like a patchwork or feeling as though the quality or consistency of service was uh, 
was quite variable. And that was something that uh, we felt um, passionate about. Um, I'm just looking at the slides for a second here. Uh, not yet. I'll, I'll do that. So this seemed like a natural step for restorative justice in BC to be having this conversation. And, and then, of course, another, uh, another aspect of this is that uh, as we know, restorative justice providers like dialogue, and, and so this was an opportunity for us to have some dialogue within the field about this question, which is, as Catherine said, it's a, it's a tough question, and it's a, it's a controversial question, um, and that's what we liked about it. Uh, so after having heard from, uh, in consultation with Victim Services, as well as Crown and, and RCMP and Ministry of Public Safety representatives and municipal leaders and retired judges, etc., about the need for some kind of uh, standards, we launched a project, and this was with the support of uh, civil forfeiture funding out of uh, this ministry, Public Safety. And uh, there are several others on this on this working group that are listed uh, on the document that you would have received by email containing those standards. Um, so much much uh, gratitude to each of those people in this too. Um, so, so I'll talk a bit about the process uh, because I think that's important in, in terms of the results as well and how they were formed. What we did is we, after fo forming this coalition of, of some uh, providers that happened to have working relationships together, um, we, we, we then began to ask ourselves the, the difficult question of, well, how do we begin to draft standards that are not so overly prescriptive that they limit the, the, the essential creativity of, of this field and the adaptability, both culturally and in a, in a broader community sense, um, but that also are specific enough that they mean something. And that was, for us, the, the, a part of the choice around the, the word standards uh, is that they could be measured and that the field of restorative justice is rich in principles and, and guidelines. And we didn't feel we need to re reproduce that work, although we did uh, summarize some of those things in our document. But the, taking the step of, of what, what can we actually say is measurable felt important to us. Um, we, we had a, um, and I will forward the slide. Can I do that here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it didn't forward. There. Um, so some of you can probably see on your screen or in, in your PDF uh, a, a set of, of steps that we went through in conducting this process. Uh, after we formed our working group, our main task was to try to listen to people around BC as closely and as accurately as possible about their, their beliefs and, and um, perceptions of standards, both how do we, what, what do they think should be included in standards if, if standards were ever agreed to, um, but, but also, um, what, what do they think of the very notion of it? Should, should there be standards in restorative justice? Uh, if there should be, then, then, then what should they apply to, and what should they certainly not apply to? Um, and, then, and then also, the, the, the big elephant in the room of if we did develop standards as a, as a field, how would those uh, hold us to account? I mean, what, what does it mean to be accountable to a set of standards in a way that, that actually... Um, uh, honors the, the values of restorative justice rather than reproducing a system of accountability that's, that's imported from somewhere else. So that's, that's, a, that's an ongoing question, uh, not something that, you know, sort of our group could answer, but it's, it's something that we were interested in asking in the focus groups. And so we conducted a, a series of focus groups among restorative justice providers around BC. Uh, we had a, a, a focus group. Some of you on this call uh, were likely involved in, in a specific focus group for victim service providers. Uh, we consulted uh, with the Vict Victims Advisory Council um, and then also um, interviews with several other stakeholders and that included uh, a long time Aboriginal Justice Program in BC um, <clears throat> and uh, Crown and police and uh, individuals who had long time experience in restorative justice. We did a bunch of targeted uh, interviews to sort of explore more deeply what we had learned in the focus groups. Uh, we also had questionnaires that went out, uh, both to our focus group participants and those who, who could not participate. So an online questionnaire with, with uh, you know, both a, kind of a Likert scale and also some qualitative um, uh, information gathering uh, around perceptions and hopes for standards. 
And so this was this was all in the sort of vein of, of wanting to hear people's uh, input and, and perception. It was interesting in that in that phase of the project. What we were really learning is that while there is uh, a, a healthy uh, level of, of just you know sort of that open skepticism to like how would this how would this work out in practice, there was also really a great deal of support for this notion, and people expressed being happy to have this conversation and so that was that was interesting to to see how how really how ripe we are in the field to, to have this conversation uh, but alongside that of course lots of people in the world have, have talked about standards and, and 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 a lot of people have developed standards for other fields even if not restorative justice so so we conducted a documentary research project in parallel to our kind of stakeholder engagement process that that tried to capture um, information on, on what else people are doing. So in, in restorative justice in Canada, in restorative justice internationally, and then in other fields that are related when it comes to standards. And that was very helpful uh, as well as, as providing us a basis and, and some information to go on. So at the end of the day, we, we, we produced this recommendation draft, and that's what you were saying. I mean, there was probably 14 versions of that. We did a lot more um, stakeholder kind of engagement after a draft was produced and, and, and said to people, you know, what do you think of this? How would you tweak this? And all those kinds of questions. So a lot of wordsmithing and all that. We're very aware that it's imperfect and, and hopefully would, you know, if this is a useful concept for, for restorative justice and its partners, uh, that that this can be something that continues as a living document and, and that there can be more iterations that are smarter and wiser than what we could put together. But that was the, that was the result, is this, um, this document. And I'll give some examples um, in a little while of, of, of some of the, the standards that we are recommending in that document. Um, and then after, after the draft was produced, uh, we, we were fortunate to form relationships with um, I think it was four restorative justice providers in BC uh, to try to implement the standards and to do that by way of a process of a kind of an audit, uh, very much a voluntary and participatory type of audit with one of our team liaising with one of their organizational members to say, okay, so are these things in place? Do you think they should be? Uh, and if not, then, you know, indicate that. But what would it take to kind of move to implementing this standard? And so Alex can talk more about what that was like for, for her and for her organization as well. Um, so, so based on that, though, we've, we've been trying to, to gain whatever insight we can from the pilots and, and to revise our document accordingly. So that was the, that was the process we went through, and, and obviously if you have questions about that, uh, I'm happy to address them later on. Um, a, few, a few things to, to, to go into some more detail here. Uh, Catherine talked about the difference between a principle and a standard. And, and that was a learning curve for us because at first, I mean, none of us coming onto this working group were experts in the subject of standards. And so we had to figure out what that even meant. Uh, and so, so we differentiated a principle from a standard by saying that a principle is something that should guide all the standards. A principle is something that, that, that every standard should in some ways give life to and are, are much more vague on some level, but are essential, and, and that the standards sitting alone would have no meaning, meaning other than through the principles, because the principles speak to the spirit of it. And a standard is, is, a, is a measurable uh, norm established by, by consent. That's how we were defining it. Uh, and so the, the example here uh, of a principle is all cases should include careful preparation of victims, for example. A standard would say, uh, at least in our example, the service provider shall afford the parties in a restorative justice process the opportunity to meet with the service provider prior to any facilitated dialogue. For victims and accused persons, at least one such meeting will be conducted in person. So there is a, there is a level of prescription there, and we're also saying that uh, the, the how these meetings occur or when or, or all those, those types of details is, is not something that can be put into a standard. It's, it's, that's up to a program, but that the program should, should have a mechanism or a policy or a way of, of making sure that parties have that opportunity. So that's an example, and, and that, that could be something that you could measure. Um, so I'll go on to talk about uh, some of the specifics. You can see, uh, those of you who are, who are on screen can see the, the various arenas in which we formed uh, standards. Uh, these different domains, and 
these these are uh, surely an incomplete list of what could be uh, subject to a conversation on standards, but this is what we as a group could come up with and based on our consultations. Um, so I won't read off all of these, but you can see uh, both there and in your document that there's, I think, 20, 21 or 22 different um, uh, different domains. So a um, few examples, and and I, I hope that as I read these out, you can you can think through, you know, would this would this be of value to your program, whether you're a victim service provider or or a restorative justice provider or or, or a stakeholder in another way, would it be helpful in any way? Um, and then also, you know, or along the lines of, is this is this overly prescriptive or not prescriptive enough? <laughs> I think those are the questions we've tried to grapple with. But uh, sample, okay, so number three in our document under standards was the service provider shall have a transparent and accessible complaint process that allows all participants to express their concerns to an identified party. Consistent with the Victim's Bill of Rights, this should be done in a manner that preserves the participant's anonymity and confidentiality, should that be their preference. The complaint process shall be one that has the support of local victim services and justice system personnel where possible. This one you, you, you heard, uh, number 10, information preparation meetings. Uh, standard around having a policy to meet with people in person uh, at least once. Uh, training, I, I wanted to share with you this example uh, because training is a, is a is a specially sort of hot button issue when it comes to standards and uh, you know from what I understand for example in, in, in Europe when specifically the, the um, Restorative Justice Council has created standards around training and education in restorative justice, which have been highly prescriptive and including formal education. And that's not the route that we took. Um, instead, we felt it was important that programs who are operating in criminal matters have some kind of a training policy and that they can determine what that is and how formal or informal that should be. Essentially, at the end of the day, this was about, um, you know, if, if we're to create policies around training, then, then who gets to determine what, <laughs> you know, what, what's legitimate uh, training? And that's a big question, especially when we think about uh, cultural perspective. And, and the last thing we would want to do in creating standards or suggesting standards is create a situation in which somebody who's just graduated from a fancy degree and who has, you know, all the credentials can, can practice in a way that uh, a community elder with a lifetime of peacemaking experience can't. Uh, and so training uh, needs to be a program decision in our in our view, um, but there does need to be something said about it in the program about what constitutes um, uh, the, a level of training required to to participate as a, as a facilitator. So that's the route that we took. You can see that in these standards, there's what well, at least what we're hoping for is that there's a lot of latitude that's up to a program in terms of what they want to do. Uh, with it. Uh, we're, we're sort of marking it as important and saying let's create something uh, tangible around this uh, on a program level. The last, uh, last example here, I know this is one that uh, BC is, uh, has sometimes grappled with and, and maybe, maybe some of you on the call have, have had these kinds of uh, conversations with either participants or with referral agents, but uh, reasonable agreements, right? Like what constitutes a reasonable agreement? We're not going to say that in a standard. Uh, by, and by this we mean obviously the, the outcome agreements or the reparation agreements that arise from a restorative justice process. So this standard reads, the service provider shall have a policy that all restorative justice agreements are, are reasonable and maintain all participants' safety, rights, and dignity and shall instruct facilitators to uphold these criteria. So that's the best we could do, and I, you know, I'll, I'll be curious to know the, the response to that. But at least that we have something in policy that speaks to the quality of agreements, so that we don't end up with um, particularly victims' needs not being met, and also uh, with with uh, let's say a young person getting uh, a number of community service hours or other types of sanctions that are way out of line with what the courts might might suggest or might uh, require. So that's that's the, the reasoning for it. Um, I'm going to show you just a, a couple of slides uh, for those that can see them, and, and hopefully everybody's got at least a paper copy. 
uh, or something to look at. But this is a, a snapshot of the what we called an audit tool, um, but it, it's or, or a tool for collaborative program assessment. Um, and, and again, this sounds very hierarchical, and it was not used in that way. Uh, how this was used is that it was in dialogue with the, with the pilot program uh, to, be, to be there as a conversation starter. So, so looking at some of the content, you can see that, so for example, standard number one is, is to do with contacting victims. And then we just have some, some sort of tick boxes next to it, in place, not in place, under development, or do not agree with the standard. So after the once once the pilot programs were were established and, and found, we they they went through a process with our team of uh, of filling this out, um, and then uh, that that could be used then as a conversation tool to to discuss where do they want to go next with implementation. So what are the standards that need to need to be in place? Hi, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. This is Catherine. I see there's a question that's come through on the link messaging, and I just want to let people know absolutely we'll be getting to questions. We're just going to continue with the presentation for now just so that we don't unmute everyone all at once. And um, uh, we'll continue on with uh, hopefully a significant amount of time to answer questions, so just to let folks know that. Thanks. So I think that that... That summarizes it from, from my perspective. I mean, certainly um, the process has been a really interesting one, um, and I, I'm, I'm happy for the collaboration on all, on all levels that kind of led to this. Um, what we don't know is what next with, with these recommendations and what we can do with these, if anything. Um, that's part of why I'm glad for the opportunity for this webinar or for this call, uh, just to, so that it perhaps can plant that seed. Um, really, uh, what, what, I would, what I would hope for is that as restorative justice develops uh, in BC, that there can be uh, a, a truly robust conversation about these issues, um, and including dissent and disagreement and all of it, um, so that we can develop, I, I think, a greater consensus as a, as a field, um, but also uh, in the process to strengthen our, our working relationships with with victim services and, and with, with crime victims themselves, and I think that that's that's an important direction for the field at this stage as well. So um, definitely uh, considering this to be a, a sort of beginning, not a not an end, and um, and I'm and I'm at least very actively thinking about how do we continue the conversation even the, even after this you know this call is done what next and, and those types of things. So I'll leave it there for now. So um, Alex, over to you. Do you want to talk about your experience as a, as a pilot? Sure thing. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex. Um, <clears throat> before I begin just talking a little bit about what the experience um, was like practically to implement some of these standards for our program, I thought I'd just give a tiny quick little introduction um, to give a bit of context in terms of the organization and the program so that you sort of know how we've um, implemented the standards for our program because it may or may not be very different or very similar to um, programs that you work with or programs that you're a part of or, or connected to in some ways. Um, so North Shore Restorative Justice, we're a community-based um, restorative justice organization, been around for almost 20 years. Um, and the vast majority of the work that we do in the restorative response program, which is our pre-charge diversion program, um, is mainly facilitate files from police referrals, um, but we also do take... Um, referrals from community members and from victim services directly um, and some other um, community agencies. Um, we are we have a, uh, about four staff in total. Um, we have lots of amazing um, volunteer facilitators and we facilitate approximately just over 100 files a year. So that just sort of gives hopefully a bit of context in terms of um, where, we, where we are at as an organisation. Um, so the first thing I guess when I heard about the standards project or and then when we were originally um, approached to be a, a pilot site, um, my initial um, reaction and, and initial response was, was very enthusiastic um, because as um, the manager of, of our program, I was sort of on something that was practically on my to-do list um, for a long time to want to have more formal um, documented um, and written practices of the work that we actually do. Um, but 
it was sort of on my to-do list for a long time because it felt like quite a daunting undertaking to sort of start all of this from scratch myself um, and, and not really know where to begin in terms of um, what headings I would even start with and things like that. So when the idea um, came forward and we were asked it to be a pilot, I, I was really excited about the opportunity and also to sort of have the support to, to make that a reality. Um, it was also really wonderful to, to really, as Aaron's gone into so much detail of, to really uh, get a bit of insight into the real thoughtfulness that had gone into this into this process, and it really felt like it was an invitation for us to be um, included in something that was by no means finite and and the the um, final picture at all. It definitely felt very. Um, like it was an, always a conversation from the beginning, um, and and there was a moment sort of looking through the checklist that I that we were wondering, oh, is, is this like being audited? And it felt like the last, furthest away from that, that possibly. Um, so it was really great, basically in terms of how we went through then the that sort of checklist of, of all of the different standards, all those sort of heading points, um, and what we noticed um, with. Um, going through them with that a lot of these things we were actually already doing already. Um, and I think that is partly a testament to us being around for a, for a long time um, and different things like that. But it felt like a lot of these things were um, not, they were uh, somewhat commonplace to the restorative practices that we were already doing. And so I think that was the first thing that was really comforting in, in the process is that none of this is, is sort of unrealistic expectations to, to sort of transform the work that you're doing or the work that we were doing, um, anything like that. Um, however, what we realized is that even though many of the things we were already doing as an organization, um, we did often, for many of them, we didn't actually have the, the more concrete documented processes actually written down. And so I oversee the whole program. And so, you know, if something if in terms of that continuity and succession planning, the, the transfer of knowledge was all done verbally. Um, and so it felt really important to have the opportunity to have these things in a more documented, formal way. Um, and so it felt also really important to have these things documented so that as we continue to grow, as we continue to increase the number, and that especially the complexity of files, and especially the, the victims that we work with that have been experiencing more serious um, um, situations, we wanted to make sure that this, was, this could then be used as a way to really enhance the program delivery that we were doing. Um, and so that's sort of, again, why it all felt um, really like an exciting venture to go down. Um, another piece of it, just sort of on a, on a personal note of reflecting of what the whole experience was like, um, and this may be just my own um, personal nuances of, of how I like to work, but I actually found it to be quite an enjoyable process to write a bunch of policy, um, because it felt like an opportunity to really put uh, into words a bit more concrete ways of what we're actually doing, because many of you that are working in this field or that are um, connected to restorative justice work may know that a lot of it can sometimes feel like it's not um, very, very concrete, and it can sometimes feel like the essence of what we do comes so much down to really creating spaces that are more instinctive and, and things like that. And it felt really nice to take the opportunity to actually pause and reflect and realize how much structure we actually had in the work that we were doing and that it wasn't um, as, it, well, it still obviously is very instinctive, but it felt really great to have the opportunity to, to make it a little more concrete and, and to really legitimize what we were doing. And I felt like by having these processes and the documents, it felt like it gave them much more legitimacy than just having this as something that, that we said that we did. Um, and so basically how, you know, in a really, really practical way of how it actually worked for, for me in, in terms of um, writing these um, practices, was simply going through every single one and trying to find a way to write it in a way that was relevant um, to our organization. And so for me, that meant really reflecting around what were our capacities in terms of the number of volunteers that we have, in terms of our staffing um, capacities, in terms of who were our referral sources, and I wanted to really make sure that the standards that we were writing were reflective of that and also reflective of the community, which for us is the North Shore um, of, of North, North, North and West Vancouver. And so it felt really important that this was a way of making it relevant to who we were serving, and so that's why it could be 
you know, to make everyone's life easy, we could just have this one blanket document that we all just then put our own letter, letterhead on. But that didn't feel like that would be truly um, community-based, and so it felt really important to do it in that way. Um, and then it also felt really important to think about how it could be an opportunity for us to have targets and goals of things that we could aim to improve on if, if those things weren't yet in place, um, and to have the opportunity to have some guidance of reflecting it of how we could be improving or, or how we could continuing to be enhancing the quality of the service that we're providing. Um, so to, to be um, to bring it down, I guess, into how, how it was for some examples, I'm going to draw on some of the examples that Aaron talked about and how that was for us um, to implement. Um, I sort of picked a few different examples to think, to talk, to highlight the different perspectives in terms of some of them being um, really easy to implement and some of them to be um, a really great opportunity for us to reflect maybe where we could grow or where we hadn't realised there were gaps um, and then some opportunities for us to, to think how can these standards be an opportunity to um, think more creatively around the work that we're doing and how can they at the end of the day actually be useful to us because I, it was also really important that putting the time and putting the effort into these, into these documents, it wasn't then just going to be put on, into a binder that was then going to go dusty on the shelf. I really wanted it to be something that would be sort of a living document in some way that had the opportunity to evolve and adapt to responding to if we would get new referral sources or if our changes would, change, um, would evolve in some ways. So one of them, one of them for example, was um, number three in regards to the complaints. Um, this was one of the ones that it was, I was really grateful um, that we had that there as a standard because it was something that we um, had a very concrete complaints policy in, in place already in terms of how we would manage that. But in this um, standard, it, it, for example, it really highlighted the importance of having um, confidentiality and if someone wanted to make an anonymous complaint that that could be respected. And this was something that as a program we then reflected that upon that our current program, uh, sorry, our current response to complaints wasn't actually making it totally available for people to do that in confidential ways. So it felt like it was a really... Um, good way for us to reflect and think about how could we actually adapt this to make sure that people have that service available so that especially victims um, have have those rights um, acknowledged and and that they have that made available to them. Um, and so it also in some ways was good for us to think, okay, how can we also then adapt it, as I mentioned before, to us also being still quite a small organisation and how can we make sure that this we're not trying to create these standards then that are, that are really unrealistic to, to what we're trying to, what our practical day-to-day -day realities are. Um, the next one then that, that was in some ways um, really, really easy to do was number 10 in terms of the preparation meetings. Um, this was something that I felt we already really had in place and, and definitely there was... Um, it was, it was what we were already doing, but we just didn't necessarily have that documented. Um, and so, as Aaron mentioned, it was important that the standard doesn't prescribe how each organisation should do it. So for us, in the standard that I then wrote for this point, it was important to think about how can we do this in a way um, that is reflective of the work that we are doing. Um, so, for example, you know, in the bullet point for our specific one, we have one about making an effort to contact the victims first, because for our program, we felt it was really important to make sure that victims are met with first, if it's practically possible, so that we can really have an understanding of what their needs are from the restorative justice process before moving forward. Um, we also then adapted that to make sure there was a, a clause in saying that there's no limit of the number of preparation meetings, because for some Sometimes people may need many, many meetings before they're ready to go to conference, and we wanted to make sure that we could really be flexible and adaptable in providing that service, um, and so that we didn't want to have standards that were going to limit us in any way. Um, and then, sort of the last one that Aaron um, mentioned that we definitely, or that I definitely, sort of continue to have lots of deliberations about, and I would look forward to, to hearing more thoughts on this in the future, is around the reasonable agreements. And, and for us, it felt like, and this is one that we're still constantly working on um, and engaging with more stakeholders in as to how can the standards actually be useful so that if you're in a situation, you're facilitating a case and someone's coming up with a proposal of, of X number of hours, um, for example, how can we actually have something that's not a cookie-cutter sort of prescription that we're then having a restorative justice version of a mandatory minimum sentence that you'll cause this many sort of 
layers of emotional pain. Therefore, you just need to pick up this many pounds of garbage. Um, we really don't want to have that. But it also felt like just having the words reasonable and fair, well, that didn't really serve much use to me as someone who's facilitating every single day. So that's when constantly thinking about how can we really have something that, that can be supportive rather than limiting, but it's not, um, we're really ensuring that we are the alternative and that we are really responsive to the individual stories of the people that we're a part of rather than um, being um, too mandated in any specific way. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of, I guess, a bit in terms of how the process was in terms of really developing it. Like I said, um, it really, I think that the, for anyone that sort of, cons any programs that are considering it or sort of thinking about how it can be relevant for the work that you're doing, um, my sort of, I guess, takeaways would be that it's really not as overwhelming as it may be. There are, you know, when you first look at the 20 points, it may feel like a lot, but sort of working through one at a time, it, it felt very manageable. And it also felt really satisfying to now say that we are, you know, a, a program that has got these measures in place and, and we haven't officially finalised them yet because we still need to go through some final steps in terms of our organisation and getting, getting everyone on board with them. Um, but it's, it feels good that that's, that the, the, everything's in motion for that to, to take things and really to the next level is, and that's what we're all sort of wanting for this. Um, and, yeah, I think then there's also, for each organisation, it's also important to think around what are your logistics in terms of implementation, what are the consultation requirements in terms of where your community is located and the communities that you serve or the stakeholders that you serve in terms of who, who needs to be included in the conversation to make these standards relevant to the people that you're working with. Um, and so and that's something that I think we will continue to work on and I will continue to think about who else could be invited into this in the future because I think um, it's also important that they are constantly evolving and adapting. And, and as Aaron said at the beginning, this is an opportunity for us to continue to collaborate together rather than feeling like this is, now that this is done, then we just put this aside. So. Looking forward to, to lots of conversations in this in this conversation this um, call now, but also sort of what this can all spark and, and go into in the future. So I think that's kind of most things from me. Um, and yeah. yeah, thanks Alex and Erin. And uh, I also want to take a special moment to acknowledge the others, uh, other authors on this working group who helped develop this project, um, Aaron Lyons and, her, and colleague Christiane Paras at, for, at uh, Community Justice Initiatives, Alana Abramson, Jillian Lindquist, and Shanna Grant-Warmold, Joanne Field, and Terry Kalaski. We're also authors of, of these standards. And in addition to uh, Alex's agency piloting these standards, there were uh, a couple of other agencies, and because I don't know what the, who they are off the top of my head, I am not going to list them, but uh, just to let you know, there were a few agencies that piloted the standards, and that is where the information was gleaned from. So thanks. That, that is uh, our, the lecture portion of this webinar. I'm now going to open it up for questions by, uh, I'm going to take the phone off of lecture mode so that we can hear questions if you unmute yourself. So please be aware if there's lots of if, uh, sound that you have in the background where you are to stay muted and let, unless you are talking uh, and asking a question, and that's fine. We'd welcome that. And you can also um, at, send a link message to, to um, present your question to us. So on that note, I'd like to start with a question that came through earlier. It said, uh, it was a question about the pre-meeting requirement. This person uh, asked, can you talk more about the requirement to meet in person? Why the focus on method of meeting over the reason or purpose to meet? Maybe I missed that. And so I think that speaks to probably a lot of the struggle the, the working group had around how specific to get on these standards. I'm going to take it off lecture mode now and uh, get Erin to, to respond to the question. And once we're done, this, people can feel free to continue to ask questions. Conference is no longer in lecture mode. Yeah. And so thanks for that question. Um, it is obviously one that we deliberated on quite a bit. Um, so I think none of the standards 
actually speak to the why. Uh, that's really the job of the principles. And so I think if we look at the principles section of the document, hopefully it can give us some, uh, some input onto why we would do any of these things. Um, but in terms of the requirement to meet in person, I will say that uh, one of the ways in which I think uh, those of us on the working group and those consulted see the role of a facilitator is as somebody who more than just conducts a process, but who also gains the trust of each of the participants. And so uh, th this, is, this is partly, this is why we would suggest meeting in person, so that a participant can come to a process knowing the face or faces of the facilitators who, uh, during especially some more uh, complex processes, may, may act as some, something of a lifeline for, for people in, in, a, in a fairly emotional, uh, you know, journey. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the notion. Um, it also raises the, the question of uh, what happens in communities or in situations where an in-person meeting is not possible. And that's a question we received from those we consulted with. Like, you know, I live in remote BC. Some of my my participants live a five-hour drive away. Do we, do we need to, you know, do the drive in order to meet the, the, the standard? And I think one of the things we learned about standards is that these are, all of them uh, are, are things that we would aspire to and, and that, yes, life throws things our way. And there will be times when in the spirit of the principles or, or in the spirit of just simply uh, a const uh, like a, a geographical or financial, let's say, constraint, we, we just can't, we, we can't meet that standard. And then at least, though, we're not meeting that standard in a very conscious and, and specific way as opposed to not having given it some thought. And so it is one of those areas where, you know, sure, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm sure I've conducted a process in the past where we didn't get a chance to meet with people but that said, we, we did get a chance to meet over the phone and then prior to the facilitated dialogue, took the time to have breakfast with them, right? And that was for us, you know, that would for us then be the in-person meeting. Um, and so that, you know, still honoring the, the spirit or intent of it. Hi, everyone. I, I just want to interrupt. Thank you, Erin, for, for your thoughts on that. It sounds like someone has us on hold or, or uh, that beeping noise. If you could, if everyone could just check their phones and see if, You've got us on hold or something. We can probably all hear that ongoing beeping noise that's happening, and that's probably on someone's phone out there. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask some uh, if anyone has uh, any further questions. Another one has just come in that says, I'm not, I'm not very familiar with restorative justice in BC. Is it possible to have a quick por portrait of those services in BC? Is it for child, youth, or adult? Is it mainly meeting between victims and accused persons? Uh, yeah, so thanks for your question. Uh, maybe I'll handle that one. Um, and thanks for joining us from so far away. Uh, a portrait of, of restorative justice in BC is uh, there's a really a wide variety of services. There's, uh, within the Ministry of Children and Family Development, there are youth probation officers that, that uh, conduct conferences with youth within the formal criminal justice system. Many of the other, then there's the Aboriginal Justice Strategy, which deals, I believe, primarily with adults, uh, um, but perhaps with people of other ages. And there's approximately 31 of those programs in BC. And then we have about currently about 45 active community accountability groups that are typically dealing with uh, diversion level restorative justice. So uh, typically cases are coming straight from police, though maybe about 20% a year are coming from Crown. Um, dealing with uh, about 75% youth and 25% adults in those programs. So there, every, as I said, back to the standardization, there's not a standardized way of doing restorative justice in BC. It comes from all over the place. Um, and lots of different strategies and models for doing, for conducting restorative justice. Yeah, we all can still hear that beeping sound. So, um, I don't know who's got that on. We would really appreciate if you could turn it off. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to go into... I have one thing to add, if you're, with that, with that question, did you want to, did you 
you have more to say on that? Yeah, and, well, just one more thing about uh, is it mainly meeting between victims and accused persons? I'd say that for the most part, most groups are aspiring towards some kind of a meeting between victims and offenders uh, how, or accused persons, however they define them. Uh, after you, Erin, I'm going to put in lecture mode so we don't all hear that beeping anymore. Excuse me. Conference is in lecture mode. Uh, just to add, so so at Community Justice Initiatives, one of the programs that, that we operate is, is a uh, federally funded and um, somewhat federally administered program called Restorative Opportunities that deals with uh, crimes of a, of, a, of a more violent nature uh, where offenders have been incarcerated for uh, two years or more. So, uh, in fact, uh, serious and violent crime is sort of the, the only uh, I guess classification of crime that, that that program of ours deals with, and it's all in a uh, post-sentence uh, stage of the justice system. So we're working only with with people um, who are victims of, of federally incarcerated offenders or or the, or the offenders themselves. And I would say too that uh, in terms of the question of is it mainly a meeting between victim and offender? Uh, I'd say it's mainly communication of some kind, but in-person meetings is just one of the formats in which certainly our program works, and I know a lot of other programs too, quite quite adaptable in terms of, of how that communication may occur. Sometimes it, it, it occurs through letter writing or through what we call shuttle diplomacy with a, a facilitator sort of bringing information back and forth. And there's also even the use of video technology that we've used in in. Uh, in, in a process where people are not comfortable coming face to face. So there's lots of options. I hope that uh, answers your question sufficiently about a little bit of a picture of restorative justice in BC. It's incredibly varied. And thanks for your question. And uh, anyone who would like to be in further touch with me specifically as the restorative justice coordinator for the province in British Columbia or with Aaron or Alex, um, I can put you in touch with Aaron or Alex. Or uh, you can, uh, I have Aaron's uh, email now up on the uh, PowerPoint. And Alex, we can perhaps get your contact information up, uh, or at least you can provide it verbally uh, shortly. Uh, so another question has come through saying, um, and before we go to the phones again, that uh, on reasonable agreements, would Alex be able to share the policy she was involved in developing for the North Shore Restorative Justice Services? I'm interested in the idea of the provider's idea of reasonable and that of the community in the process. Have instances occurred where the concept of reasonable has not aligned? Well, thank you for your question. Um, first, uh, full sort of disclaimer is that we haven't yet totally finished that policy as, as it is an interesting one um, and it is still still a bit of a work in progress but um, some a couple of I guess clarifying pieces to start with from the beginning and, and that's that our the risk facilitator's role really in these processes is really to try to be as neutral and impartial to the process as much as possible and so first and foremost we have to really ensure that we are not um, directing or imposing what we think the agreement should be in the first place anyways um, and so really to ensure that we are delivering a victim-centered restorative justice process um, the needs of the people that have been harmed whether that is one a specific individual or, or a larger community um, the needs of those um, need to form the, the real center of, of what the the um, process looks like and what the agreement is. Um, and so in most situations, um, it's, it's really about having a conversation as to what are the needs of the victim. Sometimes it might be really practical in terms of if there was financial damage, then, then providing that financial restitution and that there's not, um, not much of a gray area around that. And so that can be quite clearly clear what, what's reasonable. Um, however, there can be many other things in terms of when impacts are um, senses, senses of um, rebuild, rebuilding a sense of community, 
that is sort of a need that a community or a victim has, and then how do you measure that, and, and how do you determine how that can be appropriately done. Um, and so often it's really about having a conversation um, with everyone that's involved in, in hopefully sort of the conference circle, bringing people together as it does feel like it's appropriate, first of all. Does it feel like it's fair and and um, representative of the, the gravity of the seriousness of, of the offence, which of course is, is a very subjective question. Um, and also, is it actually feasible and, do, and, and manageable for, for the accused person or the, or the person that's responsible for the incident? Um, because the last thing that we want is building on our end example is that if a youth is in having to do so many hours of community service that it then means that they fall behind in their homework and then it results in a more negative impact in, in their overall well-being. Um, so it's all of those things that we really want to try and incorporate and the role, our role of, of facilitating those processes is not necessarily to be directing what the outcome should be but to be really ensuring that we're asking those questions so that the participants themselves are really able to reflect, is this actually a fair request? Is this actually um, reasonable. Um, we have had some situations though where a request might be so unreasonable and uh, um, uh, the process might be so, it might be so um, not attainable for the individual that we actually can't move forward in a process and we'll have to try really, really, really hard to try find all other alternatives to try to support someone. But um, one example that I can think of, there was a mischief incident with, um, where a youth caused, I think, over $5,000 worth of damage and the, um, the people that were impacted, it was a business that was impacted, um, insisted on receiving that full amount of financial restitution and the youth came from, from a low income family and it wasn't, it simply was not feasibly possible for them to do, to, to pay that, that money back and um, in terms of doing an alternative of community service or, or providing service to the organisation, um, the organisation was, was involved in a lot of bureaucracy and so they were not able to, being such a large organisation business, they were not able to facilitate the individual, be um, doing community service for them because of liability reasons and, and other challenges like that. So in a situation like that, we had to make the call actually as a decision that we couldn't, that would not be counted as a reasonable and a fair agreement if it would be putting a family in severe financial distress um, because of, of what an agreement has was. But that is just one example of, of, of that being a really, really, really hard decision. Um, and we worked really hard to try to find all other alternatives. Um, but at some point, too, it's also important to respect the integrity of the process and realise where it might not be possible rather than trying to stretch ourselves and our capacities and the capacities of the participants so thin that we're then actually potentially doing further harm. And, and if you go back to one of the, I think it's one of the first principles that there is there is to do no further harm and, and we felt that was then going to cause, cause more harm than good. Thanks Alex. And one uh, small comment I'd like to add is, is I've had calls to, to myself in my role um, it, at the province here of people phoning and saying, you know, I, I had a, a group, my, my son was on a mischief charge and, and uh, through an agency was, was deemed to do in excess of 100 hours of community service and I, I felt like it was quite unrealistic even though he agreed to it in the moment and we felt like we had to agree to it because we were in the circle. Uh, I felt like it was unrealistic and sure enough, I mean, the criminal code, a maximum amount allowable in the criminal code for youth for community services, 50 hours. So again, I think within the restorative justice community, we often like to set ourselves apart from the from the criminal justice system and say, well, we why should we have to abide by rules set by the criminal uh, justice system? And that said, I think uh, restorative justice groups can also be uh, savvy to to realizing what why certain limits are set in law and and how they may wish to, or sorry, not in law, but as as a, a guideline with well, within the criminal justice system, that is a law. Within the restorative justice, it wouldn't be uh, upheld in the same way because it's separate from the court system. But that said, to consider, okay, if a youth is getting upwards of 100 hours of community service, what's going on here? We have another question. Um, restorative justice has a very negative connotation when it comes to a community province country that views crime as requiring punitive consequences. 
Are there any ideas on how to ad advertise restorative justice so that the community gets on board? Norway is a beautiful, ex beautiful example of restorative justice working, but at least in Saskatchewan, people feel that it is criminals getting away easy. Um, so I'm not sure if you would like that answered related to this, uh, you know, we're focusing on standards in restorative justice for for this particular webinar, because that's a big question, of course, of how to change the image of restorative justice so it's more widely received. But uh, I'll hand this question over to Aaron. <laughs> well, for me, the, the answer in brief would be um, make, make sure that RJ practices do not uh, foster, a, well, do, do not create a situation where criminals get away easy. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, the, the, the accountability is a core value of the work. And so for me, I'm, I'm actually less concerned about how to advertise it and more concerned with how do we do the work in a way that truly aligns with our values and our purpose uh, so that um, we, can, we can demonstrate the efficacy of the work. So um, I think part of it is making sure that we as a field steer away from uh, uh, cornering ourselves in, uh, into police diversion cases only. There's a lot of great work happening with police diversion in RJ, but there's a lot of other applicability of these principles and processes that haven't been ex explored. And we know that restorative justice can work in the most serious of, case, in the most serious of cases. Um, CJI's program is 25 years old or so and, is, and has, a, has a track record of doing that. Um, there are lots of other examples internationally of that. In fact, where the research showing that restorative justice is most effective in dealing with more serious crime um, as opposed to, say, uh, first-time uh, low-risk youth offenders. So, so that's, I think, something to think about. I think where we, where we want to spend the energy, at least personally, is, is to pr practice in a way that's congruent with our values, that's, that's uh, theory-informed, um, and, and, and things like adherence to standards, I think, can, can help prevent misperceptions of restorative justice um, that, that do get developed when, when cases, go, you know, go, go sideways due to, say, a lack of preparation, right? If we, can, if we can adhere to a standard that talks about preparation uh, or something like reasonable agreements, then we're less likely to be, uh, to, to be subject to those kinds of misperceptions. Conference is no longer in lecture mode. Thanks, Erin. So I'm opening it up in hopes that that beeping noise is gone. Um, just to see if there's anyone. Oh, great. Okay, well, anyway, I, I want to quickly see if, if anyone uh, on the phone has a question. Uh, and feel free to ask a challenging question. Any, any skeptics out there that, that would like to... Um, that, that would like to challenge the concept of applying standards to restorative justice or, or anyone who's had a, an insight uh, during this webinar and, and would like to learn more about, about this. Okay, so we've had a, a question come in from the uh, message board here. I'm going to put it back into lecture mode to prevent this beeping again. Conference is in lecture mode. So a question saying, is there a movement to make these standards a part of, of provincial administration or grants like the CAP, for those who don't know, the Community Accountability Program, et cetera, um, from Rodney? I'm wondering if that's Rodney and Terrace. If so, hi, Rodney. Um, I, I w you, you frame that as, is there a movement uh, to make standards a part of provincial administration or grants like the CAP, et cetera. No, there, there's no such movement. This is an extremely um, uh, experimental, uh, cautious first step into the realm of standards in restorative justice. And I think it would be very premature to imagine government grabbing onto these and saying, aha, now they're going to be prescribed. We want to really make sure that the standards continue to stay with community, in a community for their discussion and uh, opportunity for changes, growth, experimentation, um, dialogue, deliberation, and so on. What we do currently have, uh, I think that, again, we've talked a little bit about the difference between standards, guidelines, principles. What we have right now for the community accountability programs that are operating in BC 
uh, that is those that are funded through with provincial uh, dollars, are guidelines. And so that's saying, you know, this is what we recommend for now as, as a starting point. And, um, and that's, I don't see that uh, until community has, has reached a point where they're feeling like uh, they're leading the way on this uh, in BC right now, and, and we'd like to see that continue before there would be any movement towards uh, implementing that. I hope that answers your question. Um, Barbara asking, is there a complete set of the program assessment template that we can read? Yes, email me, Barbara. And it's basically just each uh, standard uh, set out in a grid format with checkboxes beside it saying, yes, it's met, no, it's not, it's, it's in process, or we don't want to meet this. Uh, and that's all we did for the purposes of the pilot, if that's what, if that's what you're asking about. And I don't know about others, but I'm so intrigued with that uh, one section of the grid that says, don't agree with the standard. Uh, because I feel like, to me, that really reflects the spirit behind this process of, you know, this isn't about any one authority implementing a standard on other folks. Um, this is about saying, here's some good ideas we think are good. What do you think? Would you like to implement this? And if not, why not? So I think the spirit of that is, is coming through. We've got another question here from Edith. Were the RCMP victim services included in the pilot project? Um, Edith, the, the pilot project didn't include victim services, but included restorative justice providers. What did include RCMP victim service providers was our consultation. So we had a, a victim service specific focus group um, in which uh, RCMP victim service workers were, were present. So that's the, the level of consultation that we had with, with RCMP victim services there. And if I'm not mistaken, I can add something here. Uh, like Carolyn Sinclair, the executive director of police-based victim services, was was um, somewhat an advisor on this in terms of uh, making sure that we were pulling in victim service groups to advise on the standards and uh, um, being supportive of of having the victim having uh, victim groups take a look at the standards and, and reflect on it and, and encouraging victim groups to participate in commenting on the standards yeah for example one of the things that Carolyn uh, invited us to do was to give a brief presentation at the police victim services uh, conference a couple of years ago and we were able to then distribute our questionnaire sort of survey to victim services providers across BC um, within their application package. So everybody got that and was able to, to fax it in to us um, or to, to Carolyn who wanted to. And that was another way we were able to engage. Thanks for that comment or question. Um, I'm going to open up to the phones one more time and just see if anyone out there, get your questions ready because uh, we'll open it up, see if anyone's got a question, and then I'll mute it again. Conference is no longer in lecture mode. Okay, so just wanted to create space for those of you on the phone who may have any burning questions or challenges or, or, or struggles or accolades. <laughs> I'm curious if anyone either on a computer or on the phone wants to um, comment on anything they've learned by listening to this presentation in terms of being challenged about the way they're thinking about standards. The conference is in lecture mode. Conference is no longer in lecture mode. Sorry about that. I asked a question and then I muted you. <laughs> Hi, I guess um, my name's TD, and I would throw something out there if that's all right. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, I guess uh, my a lot of my questions um, are from my sort of experience working with Mediate BC, where we developed standards of conduct for mediators. And so my initial understanding was the um, standards devised would be for the actual facilitators rather than for the organizations that then uh, sort of oversee or sort of work with the facilitators. But I was having a little bit of a different uh, mindset to the approach here. I don't know if you'd like to chat a little bit about what the difference is and why 
the, is it some of the rationale for heading that particular direction rather than sort of straight um, to facilitators directly? Great. Conference is in lecture mode. Thanks for that question, CD. So the question is, in a nutshell, why the focus uh, of standards on on sort of program level uh, practice standards rather than sp specifically aimed at standards for facilitators? Mm -hmm. Alex? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, CD. Thanks for your question. Um, I think I, for me personally, I didn't quite see them as a um, mutually exclusive thing. I saw it more as this was a, a sort of the umbrella that one would hope that an organization would adopt, um, and then it would be their responsibility um, in order to ensure that their facilitators were um, part of, were meeting these standards and facilitating cases in that way. Um, I'm wondering if, if one sort of difference from mediators is also that mediators are maybe working more independently, sort of as independent consultants or contractors or things like that, whereas generally um, restorative justice, the, the files are referred to agencies and then the agencies are responsible. So I think the it's the one one part of it is why we're talking about it from more from an agency perspective is that one of the reasons why we thought it was important to adopt it was that there could be um, more confidence really in, in our agency's capacity to, to deliver these services because when we receive a file from the RCMP, for example, they're referring it to the North Shore Restorative Justice Restorative Response Program. They're not referring it to Alex Zur as a facilitator. And so I think that sort of was one part of it. Um, but in our upcoming training that we will be doing, we, we will be going over these standards and ensuring that all of our facilitators um, are aware of them and, and ensure that, that, there are any, that um, their facilitation skills are also meeting this level. And I think that also links in some ways to what Aaron was, the standard Aaron was talking about in terms of training, um, in terms of many of the standards actually do relate to more practical facilitation skills as well. And I would just add that, um, so CD, actually, I think, if I recall correctly, we did look at the Mediate BC standards. Um, I think that's what we, one of the things we read during our, our documentary research component, and we, we got some, some great ideas from that document, if in fact it was the same one, so... Thank you for that. Um, but but we did start at first with the assumption of creating uh, recommended standards for facilitators, and then it was later on in the process we, we switched to talking the language of programs. Um, the main reason we did that is, is because it's, it was seen as, as having perhaps greater influence. Like we could get more done with less by speaking to the program, and then and then hopefully these things would kind of have a downstream effect. Uh, on the facilitators, we we also I think we're a bit daunted by what it might mean to create individual well, to create standards for facilitation. There's there's so much that goes into effective facilitation, and it was hard for us to know where standards would end and where like a training manual would begin. And there's lots of training manuals for facilitators, and so it's just it seemed like a bit of, a bit more of a gray area. And where do you draw the line? So. Um, anyway, I think it's a, it's a useful question, I, and that's that's why we made the decision we did. Thank you for that question, CD. Another question has come through uh, from Michelle saying, one of the things I love about restorative justice is the community component. What works in one community might not work in another. Example, a victim asking for a curfew for the accused. This might work in a small community, but perhaps not in a large city. Would the standards be flexible enough to allow for these differences in provisions? I know I'll say from my perspective, um, before I hand it over to these fine folks, that probably if the standards aren't flexible en enough to allow for those differences, then they're probably not the right standards. Uh, because we definitely want to make sure that community, that flavor, be it, you know, as I was saying before, is it a hot dog truck? Is it a Thai food truck? Is it a taco truck? We want to make sure that everyone still is able to in infuse their own program with the flavor of their community and their program and their, cult their subculture and culture in that community. And so that's something to always keep an eye on. Alex or Aaron, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great point, and I think we would, or I would hope that that, um, that, that real community-based sort of essence is, is flavored through through every program's adaption or, um, or adoption of these standards um, because it totally is important to see some of these may, may – um, 
not be totally free, feasibly, practically possible if you are in a really, really small community. Um, I think there are many things, you know, confidentiality is a big one in terms of, yes, you can really say that the process is confidential and you can try to show that, but if you're, in a, if you're in, living in a very, very small community where where you can't completely guarantee that you're going to be able to provide a facilitator that is totally impartial, um, then that is going to be a barrier. And so it would be important to think about how can um, the standard of, yeah, I think confidentiality and, and impartial facilitation, how can those be adapted to ensure um, that the process is still ethical, that the process is still fair, and that the process is still respecting the rights of everyone that's involved, but that it's also realistic and you're not having to... Um, be exactly calling someone in from five hours away just so that you can meet that tick, tick box. And in fact, I think uh, I was privileged to sit in uh, um, to quite a few sessions to listen to the, de the debate and the, the development of, of, standard, of these standards. And one of the things that came up is that they're developing standards, but if a program can't meet a standard, then they should just indicate why that is. And so it's it's okay if it's like, well, that standard doesn't fit our program, and this is why. And being able to document that, that's fair and legit. I would just add that from, from the perspective of a, of a working group member, I mean, one of the reasons why we created recommended standards is to ensure that restorative justice lives up to its promise to adapt to people's needs individually and, and culturally. But that's a core tenet of the work. And, and that includes the sort of rural, urban uh, variations that would go on in, 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 in our work. So, so for example, in, in the guiding principles under section two and its number eight, we have explore creative and tailored processes and outcomes as one of our guiding principles. Tailored meaning applicable to the people who are there in, in the process. Or, or our standard uh, number 19 of, of flexible service reads, the service provider shall have a policy of adapting its services to the cultural and individual needs of participants and outlining a range of options for participation by victims. Um, so adaptability to all participants and, and particularly focused on giving victims opportunities of different ways they might participate in a program given their comfort level and their specific needs. So I hope that, that comes through clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions or comments from our our panel here? I'm going to turn the phone on one, maybe one last time, I'm not sure. <laughs> Conference is no longer in lecture mode. Beep, beep. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I'll just let it go for a moment here, and then we'll potentially wrap up. All right, we have another question come in. What is the process for taking up the standards by other agencies? Conference is in lecture mode. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe that's another pilot that needs to happen. <laughs> well, and, and I think the that's part of what's exciting is, is, is in looking at next steps and looking at the future. Um, you know, listening to Alex, it sounds like it was a relatively uh, uh, painless process and one that led to the, the betterment of, uh, or at least, uh, you know, a good dialogue within the, the organization. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, I hope that this is, that this is invitational. Um, and, and I think ultimately, I mean, it is totally voluntary as to whether restorative justice groups choose to adhere to these or any other standards. That's the reality of our field right now. No value judgment placed on that at all. It's just we do not have some sort of a hierarchical kind of governing body of, of restorative justice. So it's voluntary, and I, I can speak personally. What I hope is that um, adherence to some kind of standards, whether it's this document or something like it, is, is really... Um, the, the hope would be that, that that is seen by by as many organizations as possible as being a positive thing for, for them and their relationships with both the broader restorative justice field and then also 
um, other stakeholders, including victim services and, and other referral sources, um, so that we have a common language to talk about the Really, it's, it's about the safeguards that are in place for people. These are, these are meant as minimal standards. It's not, as it says in this document, it's not supposed to outline in detail like a, like a model system for restorative justice. It's, this is not supposed to encompass all of the sort of heart and soul and art of the work. It's supposed to create safeguards and, and, um, basic measures. And so, so, so I hope that that, that the, that the bar that's set by this is, is a reasonable one and, and one that provides for, for safety and, and, and for congruence with the, the values of restorative justice, but also isn't, you know, sort of scaring anybody away or anything like that. So, so really it's, it's like the, the kind of conversation I think those of us in the working group are hopeful for is, is one in which whoever's intrigued by this idea and, and, and likes it, Come, can come together actively to say, okay, let's 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 think about how to do this more in our programs and how to support one another and how to grow from this and and all of those things, and and I do think that that the reputation that was referred to um, earlier about restorative justice it is a very varied reputation <laughs> in, in BC and elsewhere. Uh, people mean different things by restorative justice, but I hope that the reputation can be enhanced by by greater adherence uh, to the two standards um, and, and that it would be well deserved so so that it would just be a positive on all fronts um, that's that, that, that's my thinking about it right now and and certainly um, again you know if, if there's an interest in what does it mean to implement these that's a conversation that uh, I think I and, and probably everybody on this call as well as everybody on the working group are up for having and yeah it's definitely voting on that it's just that I think it still is in, in the early stages, and, and my understanding was also it was that important to receive the, the feedback from the pilot sites in terms of what the process was like to implement so that the um, working group can make any changes to make it as, as smooth and easy process as possible. Um, but I would warmly welcome anyone to, to, to get in touch, um, obviously with anyone, with anyone of us three, but also if anyone wants, has any questions in terms of how it was for me or if anyone wants to chat more about it, um, more than happy to chat um, to connect further. Um, I'll just say my email now, but then if you want to email Catherine or Aaron, they can also pass it on as didn't get onto the slides. Um, my email is alex, A L E X, at nsrj.ca. So pretty easy. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing about how this conversation evolves in the future. That's great. Thanks, Alex. I just put Alex's uh, email there in the uh, uh, computer, uh, the chat notes there. I'm going to put my email in there too, but if anyone has any questions uh, and doesn't know who to email because you're on the phone and you're not near a computer, you can email the uh, email address that you use to sign up for this webinar, victimservices at gov.bc.ca, and the person who manages that email account will send the email to me, and I can direct it to the correct person at that point. So well, if we, uh, we're getting a few thank yous here on the line, and uh, we only have a few moments left. If, if there is one final question, we could probably take it. If anyone is uh, just like, oh, one more chance. Or if you're now, uh, if you're now feeling like uh, satisfied or, or that you know who to connect with, or you need to go away and reflect on this for a while, talk to those around you, be like, what did you think? Is this something that could help advance restorative justice in BC, in Canada, in the world. Uh, it's a new conversation, and I just wanted to emphasize that um, having been in the field for uh, a couple decades myself, I, I feel like the, the conversation around standards and restorative justice has floated around for a while, but I haven't seen anything as concrete as this project in actually trying to implement standards and restorative justice in a flexible manner that includes and is specific towards being victim sensitive. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining and um, really thrilled that you were all able to, to join us and look forward to future webinars that our division, Victim Services and Crime Prevention, will be offering. I believe there may be another webinar coming up before the end of the year, in fact. So just uh, stay tuned for those for those emails that come out. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Bye.